It's great to see you. My name is Kevin Kearns. And on behalf of Dean John Keeler and the faculty and the staff of the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs, I want to welcome you to this very special event this afternoon. Uh, I'm wearing two hats today. I have the pleasure of serving as the director of the Johnson Institute for Responsible Leadership. But as of about a year ago, I'm also director of something called the Francis Hesselbein Leadership Forum. And it's the Hesselbein Forum that really is our host uh, for today. And for those of you who don't know uh, Francis or the name, let me give you just a very, very quick bio. Uh, Francis was um, head of the Girl Scouts of America um, in the 80s and early 90s. And she transformed that organization, uh, really seriously transformed it from a dying organization, largely a suburban-based kind of arts and crafts program for young girls into a leadership development program for young women that has an urban presence, has a diverse presence, and really transformed that organization in terms of its mission. Uh, it caught the attention of a lot of people, including who, a person who's widely regarded as the father of management, Peter Drucker, uh, who once called Francis the uh, smartest executive in America. That then caught the attention of people at Forbes magazine and lots of others, and eventually got the attention of President Bill Clinton, who awarded her the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which is the uh, highest civilian honor that uh, this country can bestow. Uh, since that time, she has made a career of providing leadership training um, and advice. I know General Austin will say a word about how he's been influenced by her life and her mentoring and leadership, how his fellow generals have been influenced. She's a diminutive woman with a very, very large heart and a very, very active brain. Uh, Frances doesn't like to uh, share her age, and I will not do that either, but let me simply say she's very experienced. That's the best way to say this. Frances has been at this work uh, for decades, and I do mean decades. She still goes to work every day on Park Avenue in New York, and she still maintains an office there. About a, uh, three years ago, actually, her board of directors came to us and said, uh, we'd really like to extend Francis's legacy and uh, ensure that it uh, continues beyond her presence here, and would you be interested in some sort of collaboration? And with Don, John Keeler's help, where are you, John? Thank you very much, Dean Keeler. Uh, we negotiated a, an arrangement where uh, we have created the Francis Hesselbein Leadership Forum. Uh, it's a program that sponsors a lecture series, which you're participating in today. We also publish a uh, worldwide journal called Leader to Leader. Uh, we have a leadership development program that is run by Professor Julia Santucci. Julia, right back here in the back of the room, working with students who are seeking leadership roles uh, in international affairs. And we also have a leader in residence who's part of this program. And all of this is uh, in large part, again, thanks to John's creativity and putting together the resources to do this. So Francis asked, frankly, if she could introduce um, General Austin today. And I think you're going to find General Austin this to be a surprise and a treat. Um, you'll see that Francis is wearing her Presidential Medal of Freedom. Uh, she wears it every time she speaks. And she has a lot to say about General Austin. So. <laughs> How do we say roll it, Lydia? <laughs> well, General, I can't beat that, and I had a long introduction, but I'm not going to do it. We're so happy to have you here. The last 24 hours with the General has been a learning experience that I have rarely experienced, uh, and I'm just so pleased and privileged to have you here today. Thank you for, very much for joining Thank us. You, you bet. Yep. Well, you're right, uh, Dr. Kearns. I I am absolutely surprised by that overly generous introduction by Francis. And at this point, I'd probably be best served by just saying, what are your questions? Because, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I have a, the opportunity to undo all those great things that Francis just said. But uh, at the outset, again, thanks for that kind introduction from Francis, and thanks for your great words there, Kevin. It is indeed a pleasure to be here with everyone, and uh, I've had a great day. And last night uh, we uh, had dinner with some wonderful people who had some very significant insights that, you know, enabled me to learn some things about uh, about the way people 
forward thinking now and what you're doing and processing here at the, at the university. Today I had the opportunity to spend time with students. And it was a very rewarding day, both uh, uh, at, in a session uh, this morning in, in a classroom and then also uh, at lunch with some more students and faculty and staff, so, so it's been good. And I ap appreciate the opportunity to come and participate in this, uh, in this endeavor, especially because of Francis. And as you heard Francis say, she has done a lot of things to, uh, to, to help me and to help our military over the years. And I told somebody earlier today that uh, Francis always inspires you, and she has the ability to make grown men cry. And, uh, and she has done that on, uh, on a number of occasions. And, and I, I brought her down uh, to Fort Bragg several times to help me train my general officers. Because I think she's that good. She understands leadership that much. So, Francis, uh, thanks for everything that you've done for the United States military and for this university. As you heard, I retired a couple of years ago after spending more than four decades in uniform. Now, that's a long time to do anything. And I would venture to say that many of you in this room weren't born four decades ago. Uh, but, you know, again, a long time to do anything. But it's what, it was a great experience for me and a very rewarding experience. And I learned an, an enormous amount during my time in the Army. And I'll share with you today a few of what I consider to be some of the most valuable lessons that I've learned over the years. But first, you might be surprised to hear that when I graduated from West Point and I joined the Army as a brand new second lieutenant, my plan was to serve the requisite five years, and then I was going to get out and go to law school. I grew up in Thomasville, Georgia, which is a small town in the southwest part of the state, and there were six kids in my family. I was number five. I had four older sisters. Four older sisters. I love them. But in retrospect, I don't think that there's anything that prepares you better for combat than growing up with four <laughs> older sisters. After all, not everybody can have five mothers. And, uh, and so, again, I love them, and they, uh, they, they really did a, a great job of uh, helping to keep me on track. But growing up, growing up, I guess I always knew that when my time came, I was going to serve in the military. I was a teenager in the, in the mid-60s or late 60s and early 70s, and you'll recall that's when the Vietnam War was ongoing. And I had relatives who served in that conflict, and they would come home from leave, on leave from, uh, from training or when returning from Vietnam, and they would talk to me and share their stories about their service and about what it was like to be a part of a great team, and most importantly, what it was like to serve your country. I was fascinated by that, and I wanted to be like them, and I, I wanted to serve my country when the time came and do my part. And so by the time I finished high school, I had this all figured out. Like most graduate, graduating high school seniors, I had the rest of my, my life mapped out. See, I was going to, as I said, finish West Point, uh, spend the requisite five years in the Army, and not one day more. And then I was going to get out, go to law school, make a lot of money. Well, as you can see, that plan didn't work out very well. Almost as soon as I arrived in my first unit as a brand new second lieutenant, I realized that I love being with soldiers. I love being with them. I love serving alongside them. I love leading them. And I love being a part of a world-class team and doing important things on behalf of our country. And so in retrospect, I joined the Army because I wanted to serve my country. But I stayed for as long as I did because I loved what I did. And that's one of the best pieces of, of advice that I could offer you this afternoon, and that is to do what you love doing. And by the way, it's never too late to figure out what that is. Over the four decades that I spent in uniform, I was very fortunate to serve in leadership positions and to com command troops at every level from the, 
the platoon level where, where I was uh, second lieutenant, leading 30 or so soldiers, to the corps commander level as a three-star general, commanding 160,000 soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, and allied troops in combat. And finally, as a four-star general, commanding an entire theater of war. And in total, I had three combat tours to Iraq and one to Afghanistan. And I was very fortunate to have had the opportunity to command in combat at the one-star, two-star, three-star, and four-star levels. And that's very unusual. And I think you'd have to go back to World War II to find another general officer that had those kind of opportunities and similar experiences. And so I really appreciated the, the opportunities that were presented to me. In my last assignment before I retired, I served as a commander of US Central Command, which is the command responsible for 20 countries in the Middle East. And those countries include Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Syria, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, Lebanon, and Kuwait, to name a few. It is indeed a fascinating part of the world, and what happens in that region has a real and significant impact on the global economy and the security environment, both here at home and abroad. So it's an important region, as you, as you would imagine. We were incredibly busy for those three years that I was commanding CENTCOM. And prior to that, I served as the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, which is, you know, is the second highest ranking officer in the Army. Before that, I was commander of forces in Iraq, and I can talk more about any of those experiences if you so desire as I finish my remarks here during the question and answer period. But let me say just one more time that it was a tremendous privilege to have had the opportunity to lead and serve alongside our young men and women in uniform, both in peacetime and combat environments. And so I'm enormously proud of them and I've been humbled and inspired by their incredible acts of courage and personal sacrifice on a routine basis. You know, we do have the very best equipment and the most advanced technology on the planet. But without our soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, and the civilians who support them, we would not be in the same place that we are today. They are the reason that ours is the most powerful military that the world has ever known. And we could not have done all that we've done or do what will be required to, to be done in the future without them and without the support of their families, which is important to remember. And we also could not have done all that we've done without support of the American people. And I know there are people in this room that have been very, very supportive over the years, and we appreciate that support. And uh, so thank you for what you've done and what I know you'll continue to do. And so, as you can tell, I feel very passionate about our troops. And I could talk about them for hours. But in the interest of time, I'll shift to today's topic. And so what I thought I'd do this afternoon is share with you six lessons. Six lessons in leadership that I've learned over the years that have paid huge dividends in my life and in my career. And since I'm retired, and us retired guys love to tell war stories, I'll probably share a couple of personal experiences with you uh, as we go along this afternoon. Of course, my experiences were in the military. And so that's what I'll talk about mostly. But I do want to point out up front that the military service is not the only form of public service, or in some cases, even the most important form of public service. The fact is that there are a lot of ways that you can serve others and that you can serve your country. And whatever profession you choose to pursue, whether you're a doctor or a lawyer or an entrepreneur or a public official or a member of law enforcement, whatever profession you choose to pursue, there are ways to serve your country and to serve others and to serve the greater good. And none are necessarily more important than others. And so as we talk about leadership, and while I'll use my own experiences in the military as examples, please do keep in mind that there are many different ways, in addition to the military, that 
you can serve and every profession in our society has a strong need for leadership. And the lessons that I'll share with you today aren't specific to the military alone. The same lessons that helped me to be a better leader can and will help each of you to be more effective leaders in your own lives and careers if you choose to apply them. So I'll start with the, with the one thing that I believe will have the greatest influence on your lives and your careers and on the impact that you'll have on other people. And that is the strength of your character. The character of, of every individual is a reflection of his or her values. And our values serve as guideposts in our lives, our right and left limits. You know, as you heard Francis say, I spent the last two years serving as a distinguished chair for leadership at West Point, the class of 51 chair. And by the way, I, I didn't graduate in 51. That's just the title of the chair, just, just to be clear on that. But that was an incredibly rewarding experience for me. And while I was there, I taught cadets and worked with the faculty on important issues on leadership. Again, it truly was an amazing opportunity. And West Point's mission is to develop leaders of character. Not just leaders, but leaders of character. And I believe that that distinction is a very important distinction. And so, why is that important? It's important because Leaders, and not just military leaders, but leaders in general, often find themselves in difficult situations or situations that don't have easy answers or obvious solutions or, or clear-cut avenues of approach. And in those situations, leaders are expected to make tough or even unpopular choices. In, the, in these moments, we have to rely on our values and on the strength of our character to make the right choice, especially when the decision is a difficult one. Especially when the decision is a difficult one. And so, ladies and gentlemen, if you take just one piece of advice away with you today, the one that I would like for you to remember is that whatever path you choose, the one thing that will have the greatest influence on your life and on your profession is the strength of your character. And I'd ask that you never forget that. President Dwight D. Eisenhower, who was a supreme commander of the Allied Expeditionary Forces in Europe during World War II, and the 34th President of the United States, I think that he arguably said it best when he said that character, in many ways, is everything in leadership. Character, in many ways, is everything in leadership. So in other words, you might be a brilliant military strategist or war fighter or a highly skilled doctor or engineer or a member of law enforcement, but what's more important, in fact, what's most important is that you be a leader of character because that is what will make people trust you and respect you. And so my advice to you is to never, never compromise your values. Of course, in order to be an effective leader, you also need to be competent and confident. And I believe that both are equally important. And so that would be the second piece of advice that I offer. Always strive to master your craft, whatever it is that you do, and strive to be the best and have confidence in yourself and never stop learning. Some of you have heard me say today that, you know, I transitioned from, from being a senior military officer to working in the corporate boardroom, and I love it. The reason I love it is because I'm learning something every day, something that I had no, no experience with and no knowledge of, and, and I'm learning something every day. Whether that corporate boardroom is uh, with one of the Fortune 500 companies or whether it's with the Carnegie Corporation of New York, that's nonprofit. I'm learning something about uh, an area and a domain that, you know, I didn't have a lot of experience in. But you know what? You know what the common denominator is? All of those agencies need good leadership. And so 
I'm happy to be able to contribute in any way I can, but I'm also glad that I am still learning. So my advice to you is to continue to learn, never stop learning, learn from your own personal study, and seek to learn from others. And make sure you learn from your mistakes as well. And by the way, you will make mistakes. I have personally made a ton of them. But I've sought to learn from those mistakes, you know, every step of the way. And I think that's important. And you should, you should also endeavor to learn from the mistakes of others as well. So as leaders, I think it's important to be competent and confident because the people that you're charged with leading will listen to every word you say, but they will watch what you do. And if you don't believe me, try this experiment. Start bringing an apple to work if you're a leader of, in whatever organization. Just try that. Back when I was a battalion commander, I, you know, I started bringing an apple to work with me every day. And sometimes, you know, people would see the apple on my desk. Sometimes they would see me taking a bite out of it. <coughs> Excuse me. And lo and behold, I noticed that more and more soldiers in my unit were eating apples. <laughs> Again, they'll listen to what you're saying, but they'll watch what you do. And this ties to my next piece of advice, and that is that leaders, we should always lead by example, and we should always strive to set a good example. And it's important to lead from the front. We should always be willing to do ourselves whatever it is we ask for our, our subordinates to do. Again, they'll listen to you, what you're saying, but they'll watch very closely what you're doing. And so if you send them out into the cold to finish a job or do some work, and you're sitting in your corner office, relaxing in that heated office, trust me that they'll take note of that. It's important to set a good example it's also important to be willing to do whatever we ask our subordinates to do. And this reminds me of a great story that I came across just the other day. Back in the 1930s, there was a young boy who ate a lot of sugar. He wouldn't stop eating sugar, and this bothered his mother. And his mother asked him a number of times, hey, please stop eating sugar. It's not good for your health. But she couldn't influ influence him to, to stop eating sugar. And so she decided to get some help, and so she took her son, and she made this long journey under the hot scorching sun down to see a fellow named Mahatma Gandhi. Now, you'll recall that Mahatma Gandhi was a preeminent leader of the Indian independence movement in British-ruled India. When they finally reached their destination, she asked Gandhi to tell her son to stop eating sugar because it's not good for his health. And Gandhi reflected in silence for a couple of moments, and he looked up and he said, Madam, I can't tell your son that, but if you bring him back in a couple of weeks, I'll be willing to talk to him. Well, as you would imagine, the woman was very frustrated and upset, and so she and her son made the long journey back to where they came from, back home, and she wasn't going to do it, but two weeks later she decided, I'm going back to see Gandhi, and we'll take my son back, and we'll see what we can do to get him to talk to my son. So this time she goes back down and talks to Gandhi, and Gandhi speaks to her son, and he looks at her son and said, son, you should stop eating sugar because it's not good for your health. And the young man looked up at Gandhi and nodded, and he promised to stop eating sugar. So now his, the mother is very confused. And she asked Gandhi, she said, why didn't you tell him that two weeks ago when I brought him down here to see you? And Gandhi looked at the woman and, and said, mother, two weeks ago, I was eating a lot of sugar myself. So the story is, as it goes, Gandhi thought it was important to set a good example and do the things that he was asking other people to do before he asked them to do it. And so I think that story carries a valuable lesson for all of us. Again, to be an effective leader, I think you have to lead by example. And we should always strive to set a good example. Of course, Another important and related quality that you'll find common among great leaders is humility. Humility enables you to recognize your strengths as well as your weaknesses 
And it also enables you to grow and to learn and to make a difference in the lives of others by setting a positive example. And oh, by the way, you can usually count on the, the people around you to help keep you humble. You know, I, I remember two years ago, shortly before I retired, I was having dinner in a restaurant with a good, good friend of mine. And out of the corner of my eye, I could see this young boy edging his way closer and closer to our table. And he had a pen and a piece of paper in his hand. And it was evident that he wanted to get an autograph. I felt pretty good about that. And so as he got closer to the table, he approached the table and, and, uh, and I said hello. And uh, I reached for the pen and the piece of paper. And the young man said, excuse me, sir, are you the guy from the Allstate commercial? <laughs> and I said, what? He said, are you the guy from the Allstate commercial? And I said, well, no, you know, I'm, I'm General Lloyd Austin, and I'm a four-star general in the Army, you know, I command hundreds of thousands of troops, and I'm the guy in charge of the Middle East. And the boy just looked at me. He was visibly disappointed. <laughs> and as he, and then he said, excuse me, sir, I'm sorry to bother you, and he walked away. <laughs> and so as he walked away, my good friend that I was having dinner with said, you know, Lloyd, for a minute, that young man actually thought you were somebody important. <laughs> so, so you can always count on your friends to help keep you humble. And beside, besides that, one of the best ways to stay humble is to always strive to be a team player. And that is my next piece of advice. Always strive to be a team player. The fact is that leadership isn't necessarily about you. It isn't about the individual. Good leaders and effective leaders are focused on the team and enabling the team's success. Now, most of you are probably, no doubt, too young to remember the game, but you may have seen the movie Miracle. And the movie is about the U.S. men's hockey team in the 1980 Olympic game when they beat the Russians. It was an incredible game. And the coach of the men's hockey team, Coach Herb Brooks, you know, when they were training up for the Olympics, he routinely told his players that when you pull on that jersey, you represent yourself and your teammates. And the name on the front of that jersey is a hell of a lot more important than the name on the back. And you know, Coach Brooks was absolutely right. If you always look at things from that perspective, if you care more about the name on the front of the jersey than the name on the back, then you'll be successful because the teams that you support and the teams that you lead will be successful. Of course, another important part of being a leader is supporting and empowering the people on your team. And a key aspect of this is creating inclusive environments. And what do I mean by that? Well, you want to make the people around you feel that they're all valued members of the team. And so if they feel that their ideas and their contributions are valued, and if they feel that they're empowered, they'll be willing to help drive change within their organizations. Indeed, they'll feel like they're a part of the team and a part of the process, and that change isn't simply happening to them. And so they'll own the outcomes, and they'll take pride in the outcomes, and ultimately, uh, again, you'll, you'll, you'll begin to see the team grow, grow closer together. And so the next piece of advice that I would share with you is that as leaders, we should always strive to cultivate inclusive environments and empower the people around you. Let them know that their contributions are valued. Let them know that you think that they're important and that you're listening to them. And I guarantee you, if you do that, you'll be amazed by the results. It'll be their organization, their unit. You know, it's, 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 it's us being successful. And it's amazing what just a little difference, what, what a big difference a little thing like that can make. Now, I believe that empowering people as leaders, part of that is, is, is allowing them to take risk. And I would say that you should support their risk-taking. But make sure that 
these are prudent risks, recognizing that as people take risks, they'll make mistakes or even fail to accomplish what they set out to accomplish. I think our space program is a wonderful example of what I'm talking about. A wonderful example of pushing the edge in pursuit of innovation. And while there are many, many failed attempts over the years, the lessons learned from those experiences have proven in invaluable to the program's long-term success. As Neil Armstrong, who was the first person to walk on the moon, once said, there can be no great accomplishment without risk. And so my next piece of advice to you is that as leaders, always be willing to take risk. But in doing so, make sure that you recognize the difference between prudent risk and carelessness. And so throwing the dice or taking an un uneducated guess and hoping for a good outcome is not good leadership. I think that's recklessness. And so you might ask yourself, what then is prudent risk? I came across a great definition the other day. And it described prudent risk as accepting the deliberate exposure to potential loss when you believe that the outcome is worth the cost. Accepting the deliberate exposure to potential loss when you believe that the outcome is worth the cost. And so there was great risk, tremendous risk, involved in sending a man to the moon. But as you would imagine, an enormous amount of study and preparation went into that endeavor. And in the end, the benefit was deemed worthy of the risk. Now, risk by its nature is inherently based on uncertainty. But again, risk should not be taken haphazardly. I think that leaders have to base their decision to assume risk on, on an informed understanding of the situation and anticipated outcomes. And so the goal is to manage risk by removing as much of the uncertainty as possible. You'll never be able to remove it all, but what can you do as a leader to remove that uncertainty? And I want to emphasize the point that as a leader, if you're a leader, that's your job to manage the risk and to, and to work and to, to remove as much uncertainty as possible so that you can set your subordinates up for success. And as leaders, you, you should encourage others to do the same. Now, sometimes it won't work out the way that you plan, and you'll learn from those experiences. But more often than not, by taking risk, you'll accomplish great things on behalf of your organizations. And that really should be the ultimate goal. Now, the final thing that I want to briefly address is opposition, and specifically values-based opposition. Ladies and gentlemen, opposition can be good. Debate is good. Different perspective and new and creative ideas, ideas are good. And as leaders, you should encourage opposition, encourage people to think outside of the box, and challenge the status quo. I believe that that's essential to driving change and creating a positive change within organizations. However, that does not mean that you should be a bull in a china shop or an agitator. And I would say that opposition for opposition's sake should not be encouraged. The fact is that as a leader, you might join organizations that are in disarray or in desperate need of help. And at other times, you'll join organizations that are doing very well and aren't in need of wholesale change. But in either case, you'll have a responsibility to strive to improve those organizations. And so what you want to do is to inspire opposition in terms of looking at things differently. Again, challenging the status quo in a responsible way in the pursuit of new and innovative ideas. Ideas that, if implemented, may involve taking some risk, prudent risk, but risks that will lead, again, to positive change. So if you were keeping track, and I know that some of you are, those were my six nuggets of advice that I would offer you. First. As you go forward in your lives and careers, always stay true to your values and strive not to be just good leaders, 
but strive to be great leaders of character. Second, always strive to master your craft. Push yourselves to be better tomorrow than you were today, and never, never stop learning and seek to learn from others. And it was John F. Kennedy who once said that leadership and learning are indispensable to each other. Third, always lead by example. And push yourself to be someone that others want to emulate. I'm not talking about trying to be the superstar. I'm just talking about doing the right things. And if you're doing the right things, people will want to emulate, emulate what you're doing. Be a team player. Be inclusive and empower the people around you. And take risks, but make sure that the risks that you're taking are prudent risks. And encourage the people around you to take prudent risks. Encourage out-of-the-box thinking and innovation and creativity. And whatever it is that you choose to do in your personal and professional lives, be confident, be humble, and be positive. And I think being positive is pretty important. Winston Churchill once said that attitude is a little thing that makes a big difference. I wish you all the very best of luck. And as I told some of the students earlier today, I'd trade places with any one of you in a heartbeat. The changes that I've seen in the military and in this world and in our society that have occurred over the last 40 years have been phenomenal. The changes that will take place in the next 40 years are unthinkable. And being a part of that is something that all of us old guys desire to, uh, uh, an opportunity to have. But it's going to be you, the young people here, who take this great country into, into the next century and who, who, who do the things that are necessary to keep our country great. May God bless you and he bless and keep safe all those currently serving in harm's way. And may God continue to bless our country, which is the greatest country in the world. Thank you very much. career. Could you name a few heroes that you've had along the way? Your heroes or, or people that I, I uh, people who you held up as your hero? Well, there have been a, a number of them. We had a conversation about a guy earlier today. My name is Roscoe Robinson. Roscoe Robinson was the first African American uh, to be a force for a general Now, uh, you can imagine what he had to go through to get to where he was. He also a graduate of the United States military. He had to I think he also graduated from, from this institution as well. Uh, so he's certainly one of those that I have By the way, he was the first one, the first African American in the Army to be a four star. I was number six. Number six. So what that tells you is that uh, well, we've made a lot of strides in a lot of areas. We haven't moved as fast in some areas as we, as we probably could and should. And I'm going to do all my part to make sure that, that the right things continue to happen for our great army and our military uh, great large. Colin Powell is, uh, is also a great example. Colin is one of my mentors. Uh, I go see Colin from time to time, uh, and he'll bring me in and be gracious with his time and scuff me up like, like mentors do give me feedback that I didn't necessarily want to hear, but the feedback that I need. And, uh, and I go and talk to him when I, uh, when I was dealing with tough issues. And, uh, you know, the, the insights and perspective that he provided because of his, his experiences were enormous. Uh, and, uh, by the way, I still still scratching on his doors. I hate to pay for us when you think about this. Even a former retired guy. Uh, and those are just two. There are a number of, uh, number of folks uh, I, uh, I look up to and I think have done great things for, for our country and, and continue to work with young people to, uh, to inspire and train young people to be successful. Thank you. Next question. Yes, ma'am. Um, 
you were in a situation where you were forced to um, uh, make or take reckless risks, like how did you handle that? So let me see if I can repeat the question, see if I got it right. So if I was in a situation where I was forced to take risk uh, that was not prudent risk or reckless risk, how would I, how would I handle it? Well, I, I think uh, I think our leaders have a responsibility uh, to do everything they can to protect the lives of our, our servicemen and women. And when we reach those points where we're doing something that I think is, is so risky for the lives of uh, uh, to the lives of our men and women in uniform, you know, our civilians, I'll push back and say, boss, you know, here's what you asked me to do, and, and here are the risks associated with that. And uh, my assessment of the risk is, 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 is really high. So I understand what you, what I, I think what you want me to get done. So here's what I think we need to do to mitigate the risk. Uh, and if we could do these kinds of things, then I think you know, we can accomplish the mission. But if we can't do those kinds of things, my advice to you would be to not pursue this. Now, there may be times when somebody may ask you to do something that's morally unacceptable or illegal. And during those, at those times, you know, you don't have a responsibility to agree to do that. As a matter of fact, you have a responsibility to say, this is morally unacceptable or this is illegal and, you know, I can't do that. Uh, and it could be that, you know, that leader could go find somebody else uh, to take your place and do that. That's why I think you as a leader have to stand up and do the right things and say the right things. Did I get to your question? Kind of? Alright. You can redirect. It's just seem like a Senate hearing. You can always ask. <laughs> Um, sure. Uh, so I'm sure you've felt doubt about some of the decisions you've made. Um, how do you deal with that, especially if you feel like you've made a wrong choice afterwards? Well, you know, there, there, there's no such thing as a perfect human being. And every human being is going to make mistakes. What I always hear about most is those things that involve, again, the lives of our soldiers, seals, and airmen, marines, and so And, you know, it was very prudent. And, and, and by the way, non combatants on the battlefield uh, is, uh, is I mean, that's very, very important as well. But sometimes we'll do things in, in the pursuit of bad guys that will have collateral effects that are, that are uh, unanticipated or undesired. And I think you have to learn from those things and then go back and say, okay, we have to do this again. Here's what we're going to do to mitigate uh, potential damage that, uh, that we just saw. And I think you have to be very, very deliberate about that. And uh, so anytime that, that something happens, there's an unexpected outcome where, where we, we lost a life because of something that was done or not done, something that could have been prevented. Those are tough. Those are really tough. Whether it's in training or whether it's in combat, really tough. And so, you know, as a leader, I think you have to push your organization drive the organization to make sure that the, the uh, procedures and the capabilities are in place to prevent that from happening. And clearly, if we have un, uh, undesired collateral damage in, in something that we're doing, we want to fix that as well. That's, that's one of our responsibilities. Next question. Yeah. We'll go here. Thank you, sir, for coming to Pittsburgh and sharing your message. <clears throat> That's a very inspiring uh, word to hear. Um, as you know, in nonprofits, uh, you have a, a large board of directors who will tell you when you're wrong. And in corporations, you've got your shareholders and uh, the media who can tell you what they think of your actions. Um, in the military, uh, and one of the things that identifies a leader is that they are able to make decisions quickly and correctly. In the military, sir, um, you may not have the sounding board that nonprofit leaders do and that corporate leaders do, but you still bear that burden of being correct and accurate on time. Uh, can you speak to how you've honed that capability to be as successful as you have been, sir? Yeah, well, I would say that, you know, we do have a board of directors. And 
And that board of directors is uh, the Senate and the House. And you've seen the films of Austin sitting in front of these uh, these uh, intelligent and inspired men and women that are after covering me, covering me with questions about this particular operation or you know how much money we, we've asked for for the budget. And we have a responsibility, since they are our board of directors, they have oversight over what we're doing. We have a responsibility to, to make sure that we're doing the, the right things. But in terms of making the right decisions, I think we have to use every tool that's available to us. Uh, certainly, the intelligence community does a lot of great things to provide us with the best intelligence that, that the, you know, in the world. The president, for example, has 17 separate intelligence agencies, I think, that provide input to him on a daily basis. So no one agency can influence him one way or the other. You know, he's looking at things uh, from a number of sources across the board. You know, I, I routinely ask my staff to do the staff work uh, to make sure that they present me with uh, valuable courses of action uh, and, uh, and that we can measure those courses of action and, and measure the outcomes and that sort of stuff and see how we're doing. Uh, and then I routinely try to keep one or two people uh, to act as kind of a, a red team kind of person. So, you know, that person or those people come in and say, okay, here's what your staff said, but here's what you ought to think about. Okay? And that prevents from being in a situation where people are telling me what I want, what they think I want to hear, uh, because you know when it involves the lives of men and women, uh, folks telling you what you what they think you want to hear, that's not good. You gotta have somebody kind of give you the unvarnished truth and, and, and be contrarian from time to time, and that's always helpful. So, and sometimes they'll give you the input or advice that you don't you don't want to hear. Uh, but again, you got to step back and say, okay, it, it may not be 100% accurate what they just said, but there are some things here that we ought to think about. And you go back and you drive your staff to, to come up with alternatives to, to account for potential risks. I think I'm talking. Yes. So throughout the years, you've um, had many experiences. You've learned a lot through all through all those experiences, and I was wondering. If you could go back to talk to your 18-year-old self, what advice would you give to him?
stuff while I was in the Army. But all those changed every, you know, every couple of years. Our equipment changed. But what didn't change is what the military does is we take good people and we turn them into better people. And they, they are the reason that we've been successful. You know, not the weapons, you know, not the tanks, but it's the people. So taking care of the people, I think, is, is really, really important. So if I could talk to 22 year old Austin again, I'd probably tell him the same thing that Fox Ballard told me so many years ago. And that's what I would share with you as well. I'll go one step further. You know, when I was a, a major, uh, we have these things in the, in the, in the Army that are called below the zone promotions. So when you're doing really, really well, you know, the Army will select just a couple of guys out of each year group to get promoted early. And I thought I was doing really well. I had great reports and everything, and, and, and so the time came to select early promotions. And Lloyd Austin was not among the, among the folks that were selected to be promoted early. I was devastated. Because I thought that I was pretty good. That was a wake up call for Lloyd Austin. And from that day on, I never worried about another promotion. I never cared about whether or not I should get promoted early. Because I realized I was focused on the wrong things. And I, I, I took myself back to what Fox Ballard told me. And long story short, in the class of 1975 uh, at West Point, there's only one guy that became a four-star general. And Lloyd Austin probably wouldn't have been the guy that you would have picked out of the lineup back in 1971. But, you know, I think with the right focus and the commitment and, and, and caring about your, your people, I, I think it makes all the difference in the world. When you worry about whether or not you're going to get promoted early or whether or not you're going to get ex extraordinary benefits, you're focused on yourself too much, I can almost guarantee you that you're going to fail. Or maybe not fail, but not do as well as you could have. Next question. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, I, I couldn't hear you. Thank you. Um, so when you're leading a group uh, varying sizes, um, obviously morale is extremely important to complete the mission. Um, do you have any recommendations for assessing low morale or um, how to fix or boost any morale problems within the groups? Yeah, so I think everybody heard the question, you know, how do you assess the morale in your units? And I would say, um, can be complicated, but the best solution is to pay attention to what your folks are doing and talk to them. And, and go, you know, and establish a relationship with, excuse me, people at every point. And be willing to go talk to a writer. So what's going on. It could have been a, you know, a senior sergeant or a lieutenant that told you, you know, a couple minutes ago that everything's hunky door, everything's <coughs> When you go talk to that private, they may say, hey, sir, ma'am, you know, I haven't got paid in, in you know, X number of months. I, my, my unit, my, my leadership cares more about what you think than they do about what's happening to me. So if you want to be able to kind of pull the dipstick from time to time, see how much more you have left, you know, check on the morale of your unit, talk to them, establish that relationship with them. Go where they are. If you're eating in a, in a dining facility, you know, grab your plate, go sit down and put somebody you don't know and talk to them. Initially, most of them will, will fail, will try not to make eye contact with you, you know, <laughs> because, because you're, the, you're the woman in charge. But then when you kind of you do a little ice break in and establish a you know, rapport with them, they're going to go back the next day and say, hey, you know, my lieutenant, my captain, eight months ago. I've seen that in the Army and in the other branches of service, and, and I've seen that in the, uh, you know, in the corporate world as well. I sit on the board of a steel company. I think making steel is pretty neat. So, you know, I was going out to visit this one steel mill, and the steel mill, big steel mill, being run by a woman, 
young woman. And she is incredibly competent and confident, but she cares about her people, and you can see that in everything that she does. And one of the guys that works for her, you know, I said, you know, how you guys doing? How's morale? And without, without blinking, this guy, this big guy looked at me and said, I take a bullet for that Okay? That's the kind of leadership, that's the kind of environment that you want to you create. They trust her. They think they, that she cares about them. Again, this is not the military. That's on the, on the floor of a steel mill. If you've never been in a steel mill, it's, it's got dangers in there. Hot and, and uh, hard work. But, you know, a great woman running it, and she, she, she ran it because she came up through the ranks, and she's very good at what she does. But her employee said, I would take a bullet for that one. That's the bullet. You know, that's the kind of thing you need. Next question. Maybe one or two more questions. Sure. Thank you, General. Uh, did you talk about you talked a lot about the importance of uh, innovation and change. Uh, the Army as an organization is very resistant to that. So what can you do as an individual leader to foster innovation in a culture that doesn't really provide that? You know, I, I think that, that uh, by the way, are you there? <laughs> Thank you. 